So the first speaker of our um, final afternoon session is Dr. Darcy Lowell from the Yale University School of Medicine. Darcy is the founder and CEO of Child First, which is a, a model system for innovation, intervention in mental health problems in vulnerable children and families. And today she's going to tell us about the Child First program. Darcy. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I am really honored to be here to talk to you today. This is just such an incredible group of people, the experts who've talked to us up here, and all of those of you sitting in the office who have also in the office, in the, the uh, I really live in the office, I must say. So <laughs> sitting in this room who have such incredible expertise, and um, it's just been such a pleasure. So today, I'm going to talk to you about Child First. You've all had a snack and you've had coffee, and my goal is to keep you awake and alert during this time period. Um, so let me begin by telling you about our work, if I can get the, okay, forward, all right. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Child First. Of course, I'm very lucky today not to have to talk to you about brain science, which is the way I usually start my presentations. I'm a developmental and behavioral pediatrician, and that's really in my, you know, in my soul. And so when I start talking to an audience, I usually start there, and now I can skip the whole first half of my presentation. So that's really a pleasure. And I can go right on to talk about, one, how do we take all of this incredible science that you've heard about and actually develop a real world intervention that can help those children and families who are most challenged. Um, also, to talk about how very early on um, in the development of Child First, we started focusing on the social determinants of health that we've heard so much about today. I want to talk about the components of the Child First model so you know what the intervention actually looks like, and then talk a little bit about national replication and where we are today. So let me begin talking about our mission, and that's to intervene with the most vulnerable young children and families at the earliest possible time to prevent and heal the effects of trauma and adversity. This is what Child First is about. Our goals are to promote child and parent mental health, so we're talking about a dyadic intervention, or two generation as we call it, to promote child development and learning, to enhance parent and child executive capacity, and to decrease child abuse and neglect. So those are the most important, the primary things that we are really concentrating our efforts on. But as you'll see, there are many other, as you do this work and you really address the foundation and the roots of the problems, there are many other outcomes that we're able to get at the same time. So the scientific findings have all been told to you today, but I thought I would just summarize them. Just the high levels of psychosocial and environmental adversity in the absence of a responsive nurturing relationship. And I want to really emphasize that because that's something Jack talked about in the beginning, but that is really at the core of our intervention. Overwhelms the young child's capacity to regulate stress, and this leads to significant and prolonged damage and disruption of the development of the, both the brain and the metabolic systems. So what's our theory of change? Child first theory of change is exactly built on this science. So one is to connect families to community-based services and supports. And what this does is a combination of decreasing child and family stress. So that's one component. Get that stress down so that it's not affecting, so you don't have that kind of adversity. And at the same time, increase growth promoting opportunities for both the child and for the parents. But the other half of our th theory of change, which is so essential, is promoting this responsive nurturing relationship between the parent and child. And that, for me, is really the key, because one without the other doesn't work. We are not in a position to take away all adversity. We can't cure poverty. We can do our very best to make connections for families into community services and supports and to support them. But what we know is that we can protect those developing brains and metabolic systems. And the way to protect them is through that relationship. And so you'll see that Child First is really built on that relationship as the core. So what that does is it buffers and heals the brain from the effects of adversity. And it also promotes both mastery, self-regulation, and executive functioning. And these are really also critical for a child to have a healthy life, a healthy beginning, to have a trajectory that's going to be one of health and well-being. So 
I have to show you this one slide that's, um, that does go back to the science, because as everyone has a story of, you know, like opportunities to have times when you said you sat in an audience or you said, yes, this is so important. So I've been thinking about this, and I'll tell you about the history for a very long time, how we're not looking at the child as a whole. We are only looking from way back, we're talking about 1980s, 1970s, we're only looking at the child, but we're not looking at the context and, um, and how important early relationships were. And I was sitting in an audience and Megan Gunner was presenting. And she had told about this experiment, which you probably all know about, but it was children who were securely attached and children who were insecurely attached and a very minor stress, and she measured the cortisol. And those who were insecurely attached had their cortisol levels go high and they stayed up high. And those who were securely attached had a little blip and it went down. And as I sat there, I said, yes, finally, scientific evidence. Now I can show those businessmen who keep on saying to me, how do you know? And I could say, here is the evidence. So what about the history of Child First? Where did it come from? Here we are, an evidence-based model now, but our roots were actually in the community. And it was in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And it was back in the 1980s and 90s. And what we found was there were services. There were lots of well-meaning providers, but they were fragmented. Providers didn't talk to each other. They didn't even know about the other services in the community. And so there was no way to have a whole plan for a child and family. And when it came to young children who had emotional or mental health or behavioral problems, there was virtually nothing. And we were hearing from our early care and education providers, the worst problem that we're having in our room is the children who have challenging behaviors. We don't know what to do with them. No one tells us what to do. And when we try to, you know, to give our attention to that child, all the other children get nothing. But otherwise, that child is disrupting the whole classroom. No, that's running out of the classroom and having the teachers follow them. This was really a very difficult situation. They said, that is what needs to be addressed. And this was back in about 2000. What we found that families, when we looked at them, they had multiple challenges. And our children were living in those environments. So they were having environments where there was domestic violence and there was maternal depression and substance use and a homelessness. And yet we were thinking only about the child. There was this very narrow view as if you had blinders on and didn't see the big picture. So we had to make a difference here. So we had to be able to change this situation where children were exposed to this major stress and adversity. But then how to do it. So in the mid 1990s, what we did was we developed the FIRST team. So FIRST at the time stand for, stood for Family Interagency Resource Support and Training. And I remember sitting at a table saying, I need a name. What kind of name can I have? Now, there were no FIRSTs then. Now everything is FIRST. But there were no FIRSTs. So I said, OK, what's a good, you know, what expresses what we do? And so I said, yes, that sounds fine, the FIRST team. And actually, we were a collaborative team who met on a weekly basis from health and social services and education to present cases and to talk about families. And what could we do differently with those families? Because this is what we were seeing. We were seeing trauma, fragmentation. We are seeing absence of services, stress. What were we going to do? in order to help those children and families to be able to work together to make that disappear. And it's at the time that we pulled that together. And in 2001, we actually officially began the Child First model. Um, with, and it began then because that's when I got my first grant to support the work that we did. So before that, we were working just together as a collaborative. What kind of approach did we take? Well, it definitely seemed to me that we needed an ecological approach. We had to look at the child and their health and development, but not alone. It had to be in the context of relationships and relationships with whom? The important people in their world. And of course, that's usually a primary caregiver or other people, because what we know is relationships are critical. And it may be mom, but if it's not mom, it's grandma or auntie or a teacher or someone else who's really important. But we were really concentrating on the parent-child relationship. But not just that. We needed to look at the broader context of community. And earlier, someone said, we haven't heard the word community. We felt community was essential. So we had to take this broad ecological approach and we had to say, this is two generations. You no longer can look at a child in isolation. You always have to look at the child in this context, in this much broader context, if you're going to understand not just 
you know, what the symptom is, but really understand what underlies the problem. Because what those teachers were finding with the children running out of the classroom is they couldn't, no matter how well and hard they worked, they couldn't change the fact that mom was being beaten up every night. And that child was seeing that, they were feeling that, they were coming into the classroom, either being depressed and withdrawn, worrying about mom so they looked like they had ADD or HDA, running around the classroom not being able to stop, or being aggressive themselves to the other children there. We had to understand the why. And Child First is built on that, that no, it's not about symptoms. It's about understanding and getting down underneath to understand what's going on. And we had to work with all the other providers in the community. And these are just a few of them, because the truth is, who identifies these children? So often, if people have asked me, where do you find your children that you work with? We didn't have to find them, because we were working together as a collaborative. We had this broad number of people working in our community, sitting at the table together. And they were identifying the children and families. Because in truth, they were doing their services very well. But they realized that now that there was a place to send them, they could open up their eyes and they could say, ah, dad's an alcoholic. Oh, there are other issues here. There are rats running around the house. Oh, there are other problems. Mom's abused using substances. And they didn't have to feel they had to solve these problems. Even the pediatricians felt, OK, now I can see them because I can do something about it. We, as a pediatrician, it's very hard to discover a problem and have nowhere to send a child and a family and to have no recourse. But when you do have, you have a model, a program that says, we will take them and we will work with you and we will work collaboratively, that becomes essential and so important. And it's not only the identification of children in the community, it's the other way around because then all of these incredible services and supports, we would then send the children and families out to be able to benefit from those services and supports. And another benefit of this, of, a, of an idea of a system of care, is that they got to know each other and then other providers who in the past didn't even know that each other existed would start sending people back and forth. So it, it really connected each, each member of the very excellent provider community to others. So where do we fit in this continuum of care? And I love to think about it as a continuum of care because Child First really targets the most vulnerable. We are talking about families with domestic violence, homelessness, substance abuse, um, uh, addiction, um, we are talking about families who have the most stress in their lives and the most trauma. And it's either present, but it most often is also past. Those are our target population. But that means we're on the far end. But we have to work with all the others because we want families to have a continuum. So you can really match the level of need of a child and their family to the level of service. It's not one size fits all. It, we have to look at this in a much broader way. So what does a child first model look like? OK, at last she gets to the model itself. OK, who do we serve? So children prenatal to five years of age, excuse me, through five years of age, any time in that period. So we're not just taking newborns. We're taking a child who can be identified at any time, referred for any problem that threatens their healthy development. Um, most commonly, we are receiving referrals for children with already having emotional behavioral problems, learning or developmental problems, or abuse and neglect. And the families, these are caregivers, as I said, with multiple challenges. And here, of course, is the list that I said, but also other challenges, also other issues. Because as we know, you can have many other issues, and those can also be stressors. And the more stressors, the greater the likelihood you're going to have delays in development, emotional behavioral problems, and health problems. And so those are the families that we want to address. And we want to address them as a two-generation dyadic intervention, OK? So everyone now is talking about two generations. I'm saying, of course, two generations. We've been doing two generations for so long. So what is our approach? Our approach is a team approach, which is kind of unusual in this field. So we have a combination of care coordinators, and these are bachelor's level individuals who are actually their role and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is to decrease the toxic psychosocial stress by connecting children and families to needed services and supports. And then we have 
mental health and developmental clinicians, and we're talking about master's level licensed mental health and developmental clinicians who actually facilitate a responsive, nurturing parent-child relationship that can protect the developing brain. So you can see these two elements, decrease the stress, protect the brain, and together we think that's the way to get the best outcomes. So, we think of this, by the way, as a partnership among experts, these two individuals, each with different roles. So the overview of the Child First intervention itself. Early identification and screening, we've talked so much about that, and that is such an essential component of what we do. We, as Child First, don't actually do that screening ourselves because, as I said, our community providers do. But we started screening for the social determinants of health in 2005 in the Bridgeport Hospital Pediatric Primary Care Center. We developed a risk screen for parents, and we called it very simply the parent questionnaire. It took two minutes to complete, and that is how we started to identify children and families in that context. We also screened at that time for social-emotional problems, and no surprise, the correlation was incredibly high. If you had a positive risk screen, 70% of our children under the age of three we're already showing emotional and behavioral problems. So the screening is essential. But then what's next? Referrals from the community. As I said, they come from our collaboration, very broad. And then our home-based intervention. So our home-based intervention has multiple components to it. So number one is engagement. And so engagement is so critical because the truth is, if you can't engage a family, if you can't develop trust and respect and have a family feel safe with you, you can't help them. You can't do any work with them. So that is number one. And our engagement period can last four weeks. And we are there for the family. And we might call. We have multiple calls. We might drop by their, their child care center, obviously always with a permission, with a referral with permission um, from the parents. But still, we know that our families are really not comfortable with the system. They have often felt disrespected. They've often felt like um, someone was going to take their child away. There were always problems. So we had to give lots of time, because if we want to engage that highest risk population, we have to give them that time. And we have to, to work hard to build that trust and say, you know what? We're going to be different. We had family stabilization, so our care coordination was often absolutely critical right up front, because so many of our children were about to be expelled from preschool. Like, why didn't you call us earlier? But you know, if that child doesn't change their behavior, we're going to have him out by the end of the week. Work your magic. You know, well, we know there's no magic. But those were children, or evicted from the home, or DCF was going to come in and take the child away. I mean, these were the kinds of families. So often, that stabilization was number one. And then a comprehensive assessment, because you have to understand not just the symptoms. You have to understand what's underneath. What are the roots? Where does that problem come from? Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to tailor your intervention to what's actually happening and going on. Alicia Lieberman, who some of you may have heard of, is a author of Child Parent Psychotherapy. She said, never target for intervention that which you do not understand. And I think that is so true. And that's so important. But this is a collaborative process also with the parents. And we get to know that family. And then together, we develop a child and family plan of care, which is basically a Medicaid treatment plan, because in some of our states, Medicaid is the biller. Um, and we know that that plan has to be one that the parents believe in, that they want, that comes from them. Because that's part of what we want to do, agency. We want to build the parents' own sense of agency, I can, self-esteem. These are parents who have sometimes never felt that anyone thought they were any good that anyone ever listen to them. And then we have mental health classroom consultation because, of course, many of our kids are referred from the, the early care and education system. Um, and um, many of them spend most of their day in that environment. So we have to understand what's going on there. And we have to help the teachers understand and help them with the challenging behaviors they're seeing. And, help them understand what is the meaning of that child's behavior. Not just it's a behavior to get rid of, not just it's something that is driving me crazy, but why is that child doing that? What is underneath it? You know, what's happening to them? And when teachers begin to develop empathy and they say, oh, oh, that's why, it changes their behavior. Because all of a sudden they want to help this child. Because teachers want to help. 
They want to help and they want to do the right thing for the kids in their classroom. And we've seen dramatic changes sometimes just with that understanding. And then there's trauma-informed child-parent psychotherapy and parent guidance. This is really the core of our therapeutic intervention. So for those of you who don't know about this intervention, it was developed by Alicia Lieberman and Patricia Van Horn and is in of itself an evidence-based model. But Alicia, back in 2001, was gracious enough to send me her draft of her manual when I had already developed something. And I said, you know, I think this is right, but tell me, you know, I just need to make sure. And we had a conversation, and she's the most generous, wonderful person. And indeed, this has been the core of our model. So it is a two-generation model. So we are really working psychotherapeutically with both the children and the parents and holding them both. And in this process, we are developing this protective, nurturing, caregiving relationship and secure attachment because that is what is the buffer for that brain. If we can't do anything else, this, I think, in my heart, this is my opinion, that the children who are resilient, the children who do succeed in spite of adversity, are the ones who have this kind of relationship. Because if you remember the definition of toxic stress, it's in the absence of that relationship. And if you do have that relationship, guess what? That stress can become tolerable stress. And if you are held, and if someone listens to you, and if someone is there with you and helps you regulate, when you have extreme emotions, you don't get overwhelmed. Your system doesn't get overwhelmed. But you have someone there who you feel protected by and safe, it's an entirely different experience. So. We reflect with the parent on the meaning of the child's behavior. So Child First doesn't come with a curriculum. We come with intensive training, which I'll talk about a little bit, but we don't come with a curriculum because a curriculum says you do this on this day and you do this on this day. No, we come with very experienced people who are actually delivering a psychotherapeutic intervention. We build reflective capacity and emotional regulation. And this is very important, the emotional regulation piece, because sometimes people wonder, how come parenting education is not working? How come I'm telling this parent all this thing and they are not absorbing it? Well, if you think about our parents, most of our parents have had incredible trauma and stress in their lives. And that is triggering or dysregulating. And when you are dysregulated, you can't listen. You can't process information. Your prefrontal cortex is offline. So if we can't help that parent become calm and regulated, we're not an ability to help them. But when we can, and when we can work with them, then they are in an entirely different place. And we have intensive, reflective clinical supervision because that is absolutely essential. When you do this really hard work with families, there's vicarious trauma of our staff, of our teams. So we have to hold them. If you've ever heard of parallel process, you know, everyone holds everyone down the line. We hold the parents, I hold the staff, the staff holds the, the teams, the teams hold the parents, the parents hold the children. Well, that's how it works. Anyway, so. We also build executive functioning, because executive functioning is the other key component. As Jack described, executive functioning and, and all of our great brain scientists, that that is something also affected by stress and trauma early on. But there is an avenue of opportunity here, because we have fairly young parents, and their brains can still grow and develop. And they've never had anyone to scaffold for them. So building executive functioning is not teaching parents what to do. It's not telling them what to do. It's joining with them. It's scaffolding with them. It's going through, and when you think about services and supports, which is what our care coordinators do, and think about building a plan, it's sending, it's sitting and reflecting with them. What are your priorities? What are your goals? What do you think we should do as the first step? What would happen if that didn't work? So it's this process, and in the process of connecting to services and supports, we can actually build the executive capacity of our families. And of course, community-based services and supports, which is here, just a few of the services and supports that we feel we can get for our families. So training and consultation. I, we have a very intensive training, and I can't go into detail, but it's through a learning collaborative. It's over 12 months. It has both on-site learning as well as distance learning component. We have obviously trauma-informed child-parent psychotherapy. That's for all of our, our, fam our, um, our teams. We have on-site reflective clinical consultation, which is somewhat different because our state clinical directors, which is like our senior clinical person in the state, actually works with every one of the sites 
in person for the first six months. She is there. She works both individually with the clinical supervisor or clinical director and with the whole group. Because this is hard work and because it's not all intellectual, you sit there, you watch videos, you understand, you think about what you might have done differently. And that continues and then goes to every other week for another six months and then it's ongoing because we've learned that you can't just let them go because no one else is going to hold these clinical directors of our affiliate sites if we're not there to do it. So specialty conferences, clinical director network meetings. So I'm just going to give you a few quick graphs. We did a randomized trial. We actually did a randomized trial very early in our development, and it was because we got a SAMHSA grant. And the SAMHSA grant said, you have to have an evaluation component. So I only knew one way to evaluate a program, and that was through an RCT. So I set up an RCT way back. Um, amazing. That I thought it was the worst experience of my life, but, um, but only because it was so hard. And I was young, and I was not experienced. but. I think essentially we, we did it very well, at least according to child development, we did it very well. Um, we did a randomized trial, that was the population. These are our results. You can see the red line is our control group, which was usual care, and the green line is child first. These were child mental health problems. These were child language problems. You can see the child's language is deteriorating. getting up. That's the red bar going up and up, and the child first was going down. This is not due to early intervention services, okay? This was due to changes in relationships, changes into talking, patterns, play, interaction. Maternal depression, the blue line is what happened to our parents in terms of their depression, and here, access to services and supports. So we then, based on this, became an evidence-based model. We were reviewed by um, HHS, um, and we are now one of the McVie evidence-based models, which Michael Liu will talk to you about very soon. Um, and um, we're very proud to be one of those in the country. Data analysis is really important because we don't know that we're doing a good job if we don't look at the data, okay? And we can't replicate with fidelity if we're not looking at data and if we don't have a clear idea of what does that mean to replicate with fidelity. We tried a few electronic health records. Many of you may have gone through that process. Actually, I don't know a single organization who hasn't gone through a process of a few. We are now using a wonderful system and are just finishing our new electronic health record, which is clearly goes from referral to billing. And it has all the information real time in there. So we hope that we're going to be able to get much more rigorous data. We're going to be able to make connections between different kinds of effects. So we have process data that we're looking at. We have our outcome data with the whole protocol of assessments, baseline six months at discharge, and we have rigorous models of fidelity. But in light of our earlier conversations, I think one of the most important things about our new data system is it's going to allow us to answer some questions we couldn't answer before. The what works for whom analyzing subgroups, looking at those who did well and those who did not do well, and pull them out and ask those questions. What was different about them? Why? I, we've done some very preliminary analysis. We know that our parents with post-traumatic stress disorder do just as well. The kids actually do better in terms of the steepness of their curve than our general population. So that is, you know, and we're looking at depression and we're looking at other subgroups. But the more complex, nuanced questions we are all actually going to be able to ask. So here's just some of our outcome graphs. I'm going to go through them quickly. But so you can see, because early on I was said, well, this is a complex intervention. How do you know you can replicate this with fidelity? How do you know you're going to be able to get the same results? And of course, I didn't know. I could only try. I mean, that's what you do. And so we've replicated in 15 sites in Connecticut. And this is cumulative data across those 15 sites. These are child emotional behavioral problems. You can see what measures we used. They are not only highly statistically significant, which only says this is not chance, but the effect size is continually quite high. This one is one of our lowest effect size. This is child behavior problems, but still almost 0.7. Here's child social skills. Here's child language development. Here's maternal depression. Here is post-traumatic stress disorder in our moms or dads, parenting stress parent-child interaction improvement. So you can see here that we have been able to get those kinds of outcomes. But there are other targeted outcomes we're looking at as well. So here you can see 
what kinds of things we want to increase, and I'm not going to read them to you, but this is ultimately what we want to see. We want to see these increases and these decreases in our child outcomes. We want to see this for our parent outcomes. We want to see these increases and these decreases because these are the things that we are targeting. We believe you attack the core, you get at the bottom, you really work on those relationships, and you can make a profound difference. So here are some of the, these are our replication sites. We're in Connecticut, pretty much statewide, but we started in Florida and Palm Beach County. We're now also in North Carolina, soon to be in 25 counties, and we're in a planning stage in Massachusetts. So um, scaling is a whole other talk. It's difficult, but that's the only way we're going to make this kind of this progress, we feel. Um, I'm not going to even talk about funding and capacity, but we serve over 2,000 children currently. Protected costs. I would say that this is really where we want to be. What do we want to decrease? Um, and it's really not the cost that I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the children and families. But if we're going to sell this, we have to sell it to legislators. If we're going to get public funding, and that's the way to sustain this kind of model, we've got to talk about where are you going to save your dollars. It's unfortunate, but true. That is, seems to be the hook. So here are the kinds of things that we expect that we're going to see decreases in. Some are already measured. Some will be able to give you data from our new database. So here, psychiatric ER and hospitalization, health, special education, education, maternal depression, substance abuse, domestic violence, parental unemployment, juvenile justice, incarceration. So what's the future? I think the future is with the expanding research, we want to get better. We want to do a better job. We are an evidence-based model. But I believe in my heart, if you stop, if you don't innovate, if you don't continue to learn and grow, and if you don't continue to both learn from your families and your practice, learn from each other, learn from who else is doing the work in this incredible field and collaborate and try and risk, you're not going to get anywhere. So thank you so much. <laughs>